Good morning, church. Welcome. Thanks for joining us on, a, on this rainy Sunday morning. We're going to open our service with a call to worship, as we always do. This week's comes from Psalm 95, so would you stand for the reading of Scripture? Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let us sing together in praise. Found. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, find my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wonder. I'm prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. seated. Good morning. We are going to continue now with a time of prayer. And I'm going to lead us in that. And there will be some times during this prayer this morning for you to have a moment of silence and uh, pray yourself around the, uh, the theme of, of that prayer at the moment. Okay. So just be, I'll, I'll prompt you when to do that or when it's time. Uh, but if you would pray with me now, please let's pray. Almighty God, we come to you this morning and we give you praise. Lord, we worship you. You are the creator of heaven and earth. Every day the heavens declare your glory. You are the one who knows the stars. You numbered them, you know them by name. You are the sustainer of all things. You sustain our life. You are the one who brings this rain. 
You are the one who causes the grass to grow. Even the birds, Lord, you tend to them. When the ravens call, you give them food. Lord, you are the sovereign Lord. You govern this world. You are the one who guides the nations and the kingdoms, establishing your will and your plan for all eternity. And we take joy and rest in knowing all this because we know also, Lord, that you are wise, that you are gracious, that you are compassionate, that you are loving, that you are slow to anger, ready to forgive. We, we praise you. We come this morning knowing that you have brought us into fellowship with you through your son, Jesus, that by faith in him, we as your people come cleansed and forgiven, washed clean, welcomed in your presence. And so this morning, Lord, we ask things of you. You tell us to come to you and and present our requests and petitions, and so we do that this morning. Lord, we ask for you to work among us, among us as this church, among us as these people. We ask for you to renew our hearts. This day, Lord, renew our hearts. Convict us of sin, and as you do, God, give us faith to trust on Christ, that he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins when we confess them to you. Lord, please fill us with your spirit and renew a right spirit within us. Give us knowledge of yourself. Renew our minds. Teach us what is true. And give us courage and humility of faith today to walk in obedience in all your ways. And now, Lord, we take a moment and submit our personal requests to you for ourselves. So please take a few moments, all of you, and and, uh, pray to the Lord for yourself. Lord, this morning we also bring before you those whom we love. We bring before you those, our families, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, those who are near and those who are far off. God, for all of them in all their ways, you see them, you know what they need. We ask that you would give comfort to those who grieve. We ask that you would give provision to those who are in need. We ask that you would give hope to those who are in despair. We ask that you would give faith to those who doubt. Lord, so now we take a moment and we commit those in our lives to you uh, as we know. And God, we also ask you to work in this world, Lord, this world that you have made, this world that is yours, this world that you lead and govern according to your will. We ask, God, as you've told us to, to give wisdom to all of our leaders. We ask that you would give wisdom to our president, to President Biden. We ask that you'd give wisdom to our Congress and to our Senate. We ask that you would give wisdom to our governors. We ask that you would give wisdom to our mayors and all those who are on the councils and committees and boards that help govern us in our state and our local uh, places. Lord, we ask that you would bring peace to the conflicts that we see, the conflicts in our nation, the conflict globally, the conflict in Ukraine. Please bring peace. We ask that you would give power to your church across the world for proclaiming the gospel. Lord, we pray for your people in, in countries like India where over a billion people do not know Jesus. They don't know the gospel. People in China, people in Russia, Lord, please give power to your church to proclaim the gospel with joy, with conviction, and with the power the Holy Spirit gives. We ask that in all places you would shine truth on lies and bring repentance and change. And Lord, we also, we ask that you would bring revival everywhere and especially here in our own country. For those who are lost, who are far from you, we ask God that you would do a work in our midst, that they would hear the gospel and believe, and that millions upon millions of people would come to a saving faith in Jesus and a newness of life with you, Lord. So we all have passions and convictions about this world, and we now each present them to you now.
Lord, we thank you that you hear us. We thank you that we can trust you with all of these things. And so we commit them to you and ask that in all things, may your kingdom come and your will be done. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand as we continue uh, worshiping through song?
Hear this call to confession from Hebrews. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Would you please take a moment in personal prayer? Now hear the good news of the gospel from Ephesians 2. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Well, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Fountain City Church. My name is Doug. I'm glad that you're, uh, that you're here with us and braved the, braved the rain. And welcome to those of you who are online who did not brave the rain. So I'm just saying. Um, no, we're glad that you're here and uh, glad to worship together. Thank you, Alex, for leading us in worship. Um, Fountain City is a church, uh, fairly young. We're a church plant officially. Been, and we, we really believe that, that we were designed to know God, to have a, an abundant life in relationship with God, and it's through His Son, Jesus, that we have that relationship. And so it's our desire that we give everybody an opportunity to grow in that relationship, and then we want to make um, Jesus known in our community. And, and so that's what we're about. We're about growing in understanding and knowledge of God's Word and, and what He has instructed us, and then how to live in, in, in that way. And so we, we, we offer activities, we offer uh, life opportunities to engage in those types of things. And so I wanted to alert you, so we, we kind of always have some announcements that we want you to know. And so here's what I want to tell you today. There's a, in, in a few weeks in June, we're going to have a real kind of a focused, um, opportun- some focused opportunities to live out this missional lifestyle that we so often talk about, but so often it's hard to live that way. Um, for various reasons, but, but we're going to give you some, some opportunities, and it's going to be one training and three kind of opportunities to take steps of faith in that training, and so the, this June, we're going to do that, and so in partnership with Crew and, and another church that's become friends of ours, um, we're going we're gonna, to uh, provide this opportunity, so here's, here's what we're doing. The one training is this. We're, we're going to do a training, an evangelism training. It's called Becoming a, a Cojourner. And please, when I say evangelism, don't check out yet. <laughs> I know that when you hear that word, it's like, okay, I'm, that, this is not for me. But, but beca- uh, cojourner is a, is a kind of a made-up word, but it, it implies that everybody's on a spiritual journey. That God's at work in people's lives, and he wants to use us in their lives. And so our role as a believer is to simply come along other people on their spiritual journeys, to explore where they're at. And so that's why we call it co- the, 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 the training, becoming a cojourner, becoming someone who can walk along somebody else, providing, uh, providing um, insights and, and understanding and in, in, in growth with that. And so that's going to happen. So this training, it's about a two-hour training, and it's going to take place at Neighborhood Church, which is over at basically 91st and Antioch. And so we're going we're, we're gonna to be included in that, and so we would love for anybody... Uh, who would like to come? It's going to be on a Thursday night, June second, at seven p.m. And we're going to get—it's an interactive time, and we're going to talk a lot about uh, what it means to be that that framework of being a cojourner. And it's, there's also going to be so some skills and some practical tools to use as we as we uh, cojourn with other with other people. Um, and so that's uh, that's our first step. And so I would I would ask you to mark that on your calendar if you can come. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Um, as we as we um, as we go, this 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 workshop it's very interactive. But we talk about three, uh, I guess, f- spheres or modes of evangelism, and and in other words, there's different contexts for for the times that we get to share our faith. One sometimes it's a natural natural. It's with one on one. It's with our neighbors. It's our friends or family, uh, and it's, so we call it this the natural mode of evangelism. There's another mode that sometimes we rely upon, and it's called this ministry mode, where we invite to an event and where the gospel will be shared, right? And, and so we, we, whether it be an Easter service or a Christmas service, we invite them to church. We know that J- Pastor James is going gonna, is gonna to share the gospel, and so it's, it's, uh, we're bringing them into that event. And then there's also a third mode called community mode, and that's just where we invite them into our life. We invite them into the community of the body of Christ, where they're going to see and interact, rub shoulders with, with each other, with, with, the, with the people in the body of Christ. And it's no pressure, but it's just a chance for them to observe, so this is what the church is like. All right, so we're going to do one training and three opportunities, and so the three opportunities are in line with each of those modes of evangelism. And so the first opportunity is on first Friday, right in the next day after the training, on Friday, June 3rd. First Friday's downtown, the Crossroads District. We're going to go downtown. We're just going to 
have fun and, and interact with people, but we're going to also engage with people in spiritual conversation. So it's kind of that, it's, we would say it's a natural mode in that we're building relationships with the people we meet down there. And that's going to be like that, that Friday evening. And that either we'll, we'll have a table set up and do some fun things that way. Uh, the, other, the other opportunity is going to be our own picnic in the park, which we've been talking about for a while. That's kind of that community mode evangelism where we're going to invite, we're going to just be here. We're going to be having fun. We're going to be fishing, playing pickleball, playing yard, yard sports and, uh, or lawn, lawn games. And we're just going to invite our neighbors and our friends into that. And, and so that's that, we'll just give them a chance to interact with, with others in our, in our congregation. And, then the, and that's, so Wednesday, June 8th, and then the third opportunity is going to be more of a ministry mode. And it's a really cool event we call Story of the Soul. And Story of the Soul is a coffee house environment, kind of an interactive coffee house environment around the arts and around a theme uh, that, our, that the soul of man has been saying, uh, uh, learning since the beginning of time. It's longings of the heart, and it's the brokenness that we, that, the things that break our heart. And how, does, and, and, and how do the arts address those things? And then we wrap that up with a gospel presentation that talks about how the gospel uh, answers that longing of the heart. And so the story of the soul is Saturday, June 11th, and that's also going to be at Neighborhood Church. And so I know that's a lot of information. We'll give you more. Matter of fact, there's, over at the table, we're going to have a little, uh, this is for story of the soul. It's going to be a little ticket um, it's not required to come in, but it just looks like a, a, a ticket that, uh, that will remind you of that. And we'll have these available and more announcements and more things printed in weeks to come. But we just wanted to alert you to that and let you know that this is going to be a chance to, to stretch our legs a little bit in the area of missions and the area of, of engaging the, the unengaged and engaging our neighbors. And so I hope you will have a chance to be a part of any and all of those or all of those. All right? So with that, um, I'm going to read our passage for this morning. Um, it comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 17 through uh, chapter 3, 13. And so it's a longer passage, but if you're able, I would love for you in honor of God's word to stand with us while I, while I read this before James comes up and, and unpacks it for us. Paul writes this in chapter 2. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly. I, Paul did, again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who was our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our laborers might have been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you will always have a pleasant memories of of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now, may our God and Father himself our, and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and, and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Doug. Exciting about all these opportunities we have coming up. Thanks for sharing all of that. Hopefully it'll work out for a lot of us to be able to join in those. I know it's going to be a great time. 
Um, it's really good to see you. I, I mean, I'll tell you, I, I, I was not expecting this rain this morning. I don't know if you were. I thought it was going to be dry today. I went out this morning to walk the dog like I always do. We got about 10 minutes out there and it was like, whoops. And we turned right around and like ran home as this like dark thing just came over us and it started pouring. But uh, we are grateful for the rain, right? Yes. Um, hey, kids. In a few weeks, some of you are going to, at your school, have a day that was my favorite day, the day I looked forward to as a kid, at school anyway, more than any other day, except for the last day of school. Do you know what that day is? Field day. You got a guess? Field day. Oh, man, I loved field day. What happens on field day? We all, as classes, in all of our classes at school, we get to, like, have all these games, races, competitions, and you get little ribbons if you win. At least you used to get little ribbons if you won. Um, I just love that day. I only won a few times, but I loved it. I loved, like, the sprints. Like, we do, you know, it's, like, I don't forget. 30-yard dash, 40-yard dash, everybody lines up and just runs as fast as they can. We had, like, uh, sack races in our field day. I don't know if you have those. It's yours. We had tug-of-war. Have you ever played tug-of-war? Where you have a big rope, and there's some, some people on one side and some people on the other side, and you pull it as hard as you can on your side to see if you can pull the other people across the line. That was a fun game. Do you have any games that you really like? Are there any games like that that are your favorites, whether it's at field day or at your house or anywhere? Any kind of game. I heard that from Anaya. What'd you say, Anaya? Hide and seek. seek. Awesome game. Yeah, Lucy. Freeze tag. You know it, yeah? I see a lot of people coloring. You usually might say they have a favorite game, but I, I, Kingman. Tag. Yes. We've got a theme going. Annie. Sack races. One more. Adeline, did you want to share something? Bingo. It's a great game. When you are playing a game like that, your favorite game, do you like kind of try your best to win? Does anybody try their best like that because they really want to win? Yes, of course. I, at least I did when I was a kid. Today we're going to talk about something that we're going to, from the, what Pastor Doug just preached. Or, uh, preached. Mr. I just called it, whatever. That Mr. Doug just read to us from the Bible. Sorry. Um, that's going to be a lot like when we play games or when we try to go after something and win something. The Apostle Paul is going to tell us that there's something in our lives that we should like kind of go for and try to win like we do these games. And that thing is our faith. It's faith in Jesus. So we're going to talk about faith in Jesus today, almost like tug of war, how we're like working so hard to win and pull uh, the, the rope across with our faith in the sense that all of our lives, we follow after Jesus as hard as we can, as strong as we can, as fast as we can, like we do with these games. And some of the ways that we do that, that we're going to talk about as you grow up and as we talk today, are things like this. How do we follow after Jesus like we might be running a race like in a game? Pay attention when we're in church. That's one way. Ask mom and dad questions about the Bible when you have a question or about God. Ask your mom and dad, what does this mean? I want to grow. I want to know more about God. Think about the Bible stories that you hear. If mom and dad reads you a Bible story at night, think about those things. When we talk about Bible stories in church, think about what is God telling me? Obey what Jesus says. We obey what Jesus says. That's like pursuing Jesus in our faith. And as we do this, here's the good news also that we're going to hear today. Okay, kids, hear this. Know that as you follow Jesus, like you're kind of almost like in a race, Jesus is on your team, and he is always doing what he can to help you win, to help you be faithful, to help you keep following him all of your life. Jesus is with you, and he will help you, all right? All right, with that, let's pray, and then we'll get into this passage more in depth. So please pray with me. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this place where we thank you for your word, for revealing yourself to us and letting us know who you are, for letting us know your will for our lives, letting us know that you love us, that you've come to us in your son Jesus to bring us into eternal and everlasting life with you. We ask that as we open your word that you would give us understanding, that you'd help us to attend to these things, and we ask that you would, by your spirit, work among us, that your will be done, that our minds might be renewed more and more, and we might be transformed more and more into the image of Jesus, the image of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, I don't know how many of you are horse racing fans. I'm not really much of a horse racing fan. But last week, if you missed it, last weekend, last Saturday, was the Kentucky Derby, which is like the biggest horse race of the year, every year. And if you missed the race last week, I want to tell you, go to YouTube this afternoon and watch it on YouTube. This was the like most amazing horse race I've ever seen. I saw it after the fact, because I saw these people talking about it. It was so cool, so cool. Rich Strike, this was the name of the horse, Rich Strike was the longest shot to win the race. He was an 80 to one shot. That's like basically irrelevant. But he got in last minute and uh, despite like being a little bit behind as he went, he came way back on this final third turn and won the race. And it was amazing when you watch this, how he like wove in and out of these horses and like down the stretch was just like shot out of a cannon and just passed all these horses who were far more superior in their pedigree and their legacy and all that. He just took off and he won. It was awesome. As I watched it, what, I, what, what really struck me as I'm watching this horse just plow through this field and like, you can see him like, I know it's a horse, but you can like see on his face just this like, I'm, I'm gunning for this, I got you. And he's straining as he goes down the stretch. I loved how you have this image of him just going for it. He sees the line, he knows what he's there to do, and he's just getting after it. He's fighting for this thing with all he has. He's contending as strong as he can. He was there for one reason, and he went with it with all of his might. I loved it. And with that image in your head, I want you to think for a moment about your own life. Okay, think about your life, and think about what are you fighting for in life like that? What are you pushing for, straining for, contending for in life? What is the one thing you're going after with all your might? I'm going to stress this morning from our passage that there is one thing for all of us, no matter who we are, no matter our age, no matter what we believe about Jesus or don't yet believe about Jesus, there is one thing that God wants all of us to fight for, to contend for, to strive after more than anything else. And that one thing is our faith. Your faith and the faith of others. And so what you're going to hear me preach this morning is this. Fight for faith in Jesus, knowing that Jesus fights for you. Fight for faith in Jesus, knowing that Jesus fights for you. So let me give you some context. We are continuing our study through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And you remember that this is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a little baby church that he planted in the ancient city of Thessalonica. Paul, a guy named Silas, and another guy named Timothy had come to this city 2,000 years ago. They had preached the gospel of Jesus. And a few of the Thessalonians there, they believed. They responded with faith. We looked at this in chapter 1 a few weeks ago, how they had this dramatic conversion their whole lives changed. They heard the gospel of Jesus, and they went like all in. They turned, Paul tells them, from uh, idols to the one true God, and they served him, and I mean, everything was different for them. And then Paul kind of stayed there for a few months, and they built up this little new church. But then the community around this church got a little frustrated, and they started trying to silence the gospel. They didn't like the gospel, as, as Doug preached last week. The gospel can be offensive. The gospel, even though it's good news, it calls us to repent. It calls us to turn from our way and go the way of Jesus if we want to know who God is and have life with God. And so this little baby church is facing this hostility around the, uh, or from their community. The apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy, they had to leave town. They left on the cover of night. You can read this in Acts 17 because their lives were in danger. And now Paul is writing this letter to this church. Just a few months after he had left, this little baby church, not even a year old yet. Imagine that. Brand new converts in Jesus, brand new believers in Jesus. Maybe a year at the most they've been trusting Jesus. And they're uh, experiencing all of this opposition and persecution from their community. What we're reading this morning, this long passage, I know it's long. What we're reading here is the Apostle Paul's experience. This is, this is him sharing with the church and now sharing with us his experience of what it was like for him to be separated from this church. What he was thinking, what he was doing, what he was feeling about, or feeling while he was away from these believers who he knows responded to his message. He came and preached the gospel. They followed his message. And now they're enduring persecution because of it. 
So you could say, he's the one responsible for all the suffering that they're enduring. So he's telling them, here's, here's how I'm feeling about you, thinking about you as I'm gone. And through it all, there's one thing he's most concerned about. Now, if you were in that spot, I wonder how, how, I thought, like, how would I respond? What would I be most concerned about? A lot of people today would be, man, I would say, I'm so concerned. I'm thinking about your flourishing. You're thriving in life. That's what I most want to see happen for you. Say, man, I, I most want to, I know that you're being persecuted for faith. I just want to see that persecution end. I want that out of your life. And I think those would be good things. But what is the one thing that Paul is most concerned about for these Christians in this city of Thessalonica? Let's look back at the passage. I'm going to point out there's five times where we see it explicitly, and there's many times where we see it implicitly. Here's what Paul is concerned about. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. He says, we sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service to you, okay, knowing you're going through some persecutions. We sent him to you to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. Verse 5, chapter 3, for this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent out to find about your faith. Chapter 3, verse 6, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us good news about your faith. Verse 7, therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and our persecution, Paul's undergoing some hard things, he says, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. And then verse 10, he says, night and day, we are praying most earnestly right now that we can come see you again. One, because we like you, but also listen to what he says. So that we can supply what is lacking in your faith. The Apostle Paul, his one thing that he's most concerned about for this church in Thessalonica, these Christians there, what does he care about? What is he concerned about? Their faith in Jesus. Their ongoing dependence and trust and belief in Jesus, regardless of the circumstances that they're experiencing. This is what he is most concerned about. And the same goes for you and me. This is what the Apostle Paul would write to us today in 2022, North America, Kansas, or Missouri. He would be concerned about your faith. And the reason for that, for us and for the Thessalonians, is because of this. Your faith in Jesus is the most important thing you have. This is your most important possession, is your faith in Jesus. You look at your life, you take an assessment, an inventory, what is, what's most valuable, what's most important? It's your faith in Jesus. And it's, let me tell you why, because some of you are going, well, really? Yes, here's why. Because it is through your faith in Jesus, your belief on him, your trust in him, your dependence on him, that you, one, you belong to him, and two, it's through that faith that we all receive the salvation, the life with God that Jesus came to give us. And it's not, some of you may go, well, wait a second, I thought like God himself and the kingdom of God and salvation was our greatest possession. It is, yes, but that's God's work. The only thing that you and I actually have that's like we're holding on to in our hands is our faith. Because think we just read this in, in our time of uh, assurance of, of pardon. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It is by grace you've been saved. All of God's work, all that Jesus does saves us. But it is through what? Faith. Through faith. So they're, kind of, they're, they're connected. Our faith and, and God's work and salvation is connected. But without faith, we have no salvation in Jesus. You can think of it like this image. Think of it like a safety deposit box. If all of God's saving work in Jesus is like a safety deposit box, it's all kept in there, your faith is like the key that can open that box. If you don't have faith, you have no access to that box. This is the clear message of Scripture. It's the clear message of the New Testament. It is through faith that you and I are saved. Your faith in Jesus is the most important possession that you hold. And this, is what Paul, this is why Paul is so, so concerned and focused on the faith of the Thessalonians and your faith as well. Now, what's, what's interesting in this, and maybe a little or a lot even like tension creating, you might be feeling this, is the way that Paul himself in this passage is talking about their faith, the faith of the Thessalonians. Because throughout the passage, the way that Paul describes his experience in his absence from the church is there is a strong hint of concern for Paul. There is a lot of worry, there's anxiety here in Paul about the faith 
of the Thessalonians. This church, these Christians, who, by the way, he saw go from like darkness to light in the most dramatic way. But he's worrying about their faith. And some of you are going, why? Let's keep going. Let's, let's read a longer passage here. I want to read uh, chapter 3, verses 2 through 5 to talk about this. Okay, so if you have it on your worship order, read with me. Beginning in verse 2, he says, We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. And for this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. When I was in my early 20s, a brand new believer in Jesus, I had really sincerely just put faith in Jesus and started following him. I read a book that was very popular in the, I think the 80s was when it had come out. That book was called This Present Darkness. I don't know if you've heard of that book. I don't know if you've read that book. I read that book, and I, got a bit, I loved it. I thought it was such a cool story and a great book. It was about this small town in the Pacific Northwest that had become like this center of the world's biggest like, spiritual battle. Like hundreds or tens of thousands of angels were sent to this small town to help the Christians there because they were engaged with a spiritual battle against tens of thousands of demons who had come to this town who were supporting this like coup and this takeover of this it's a cool story, but this thing that would like go throughout the, the United States and like wreck the church, okay? And so there's this huge spiritual battle going on. Now, 20 some, well, not 20, but almost 20 years later, I, I don't know that I would, that I still love everything that's in that book. I, I don't know that I agree with, I don't know how much I still agree with that book about spiritual warfare and just the unseen realm. However, what I am very grateful for about having read that book in those formative years of faith was that early on, it, I got a very clear vision for something that gives so many of us as modern people a very hard time believing. And that is that we all have enemies to our faith. There is an enemy and there are enemies to your faith. And you need to know that. We all need to know that. The Apostle Paul he is concerned for the Christians in Thessalonica, not only because of their sufferings, and he is concerned about that, right? That these, these persecutions, these sufferings that they're ongoing, are undergoing might unsettle them, he says. And he was concerned about that, but he's very concerned about, he said this in verse 5, that the tempter might use those sufferings to destroy their faith. Look again at verse 5. Right, uh, second half of verse 5. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. Now, there's two questions I want to look at with that. What, what and who is this tempter that he's talking about? And what does it mean that he would say our labor was in vain? Why would he say that? Well, first, the tempter. Now, I know you're going to have all kinds of intellectual trouble with this, challenges with this. I get that. Please don't get hung up on that. The tempter that Paul is referring to is Satan, the devil. And he already mentioned Satan earlier in the passage in, in chapter 2. He says Satan kept him from going to Thessalonica. We know about Satan in the, New, in the Bible from the book of Genesis, from the book of Job, from the New Testament. Jesus talks about Satan. He's seen Satan fall from heaven. We see Paul talking about Satan. We, say, we see Satan in the book of Revelation. He's all over the Bible. But here's the thing. We don't know that much about him. We don't know that much about the tempter. And people get into trouble when they look too deeply into that or try to know too much about the devil or Satan and try to think too much about how he interacts with our lives. We don't really know that much. Here's what we do know from the Bible. He's real. He's a supernatural being who has a lot of power. He seems to direct other supernatural beings who all hate God and his kingdom and his rule and his gospel. And what we see from the Bible is that Satan, especially the New Testament, more than anything else, wants to silence the gospel, wants to keep the church of Jesus from growing, and he wants to destroy our faith. That is his MO. And he's an enemy to you and me and all of our faith. And Paul is referring to him here. Now, the way that Satan works the most is by tempting us, the tempter, to believe lies. 
to get our eyes off the truth and to believe things that are false. And by believing things that are false, keep us from knowing who God is, who is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So Satan wants to keep us from knowing the truth and keep us bound to lies. So when Paul says he's the tempter here in Thessalonica, he's probably referring to that, that the tempter would have caused you to believe lies about Jesus instead of focus and know the truth. But what does he mean when he says in vain, right? He says, I was afraid that the tempter might have tempted you and that all our labors might have been in vain. Well, very simply, he's saying that he was worried that the Christians in Thessalonica had given up their faith. That they had said, we're out, we're done. You were right, friends, who are, who are making my life miserable. You're telling me Jesus, this guy, that well, Paul, who preached Jesus, was a total fraud, and this thing about Jesus of Nazareth is not true, and this experience we had was, like, not really real, and, yeah, okay, we're going to give up and go back to the old ways. We don't believe in this anymore. That's what in vain would have meant, that this didn't actually take. The church doesn't exist in Thessalonica anymore. So that's what Paul is worried about. Now, like I said, without getting hung, hung up on Satan, what I do want you to focus on is the principle here. The principle that we all have. We have enemies to our faith. That's the principle. And when you think about your own faith, I'd encourage you to think about what do you find most challenging? What, what forces you into struggles and, and trials? And what weakens your faith the most? What dampens your faith? It's important to identify those enemies so we can fight them well. For a lot of us, it's probably doubt. Intellectual doubt. We go, how could this be true? Should I really believe this and follow all this? Because it, when it's hard, if it's not true, I don't want to follow it. So we have intellectual doubt. It could be doubt that comes from circumstances. We go, man, how could God really be good if this is happening in my life? I don't know if I can actually believe this. Doubts can weaken our faith. Also, I think a big one that's easier for, this, for Satan to play on in our lives, the tempter, is despair. And when we get into times of despair, we can really get into dark places with God. Difficult times come into our lives. Things get heavy. We can think, this is too hard. I, I don't know how God could be involved with this. I just want out. I want to find a different way to make myself feel better. Could be we get pressure from an antagonistic environment like the Thessalonians are experiencing. Could be confusion from all the voices we have today. You know, all this stuff we hear from the whatever sources of input and information you are receiving, you're getting confusion. You're getting despair probably going, I don't know what's true. I don't know if I can do this. I want out. I just, I don't want to have to deal with this anymore. You might want to say, I mean, it's not worth it. Whatever it is, we all, we all have something. There are things that work to, to counter act to work against our faith in Jesus. And just like with the Thessalonians, those difficult circumstances, they can unsettle us, right? You ever feel that? The same tempter gets involved in our lives and wants us to start to believe lies instead of the truth. And he wants to try to use all those circumstances to destroy our faith. Now, with all of that said, I know that's heavy and that's not fun to think about, but this is the reality that Paul is dealing with in these passages. And uh, there's a question that I bet you, a lot of you are thinking, I can see a lot of fidgeting and a lot of like uncomfortable looks. And I understand why. And there's probably a question that you're wrestling with theologically and, and intellectually. You're, you're wondering, why would Paul be that worried? Why would he really be that worried? Because you're thinking, well, can genuine faith in Jesus really be destroyed? Can that actually happen? In other words, can someone who has genuine faith in Jesus... They've really trusted Jesus, they believe, and they follow him with dependence and faith. Can they ever give up that faith? Can they ever cut off their relationship with Jesus? Can they say, I'm out, I'm done, you can keep it, I'm going my own way? Is that even possible? And the, the short answer, and I only have time for a short answer, but the short answer of the Bible is this, how I understand it anyway, it's very unlikely, but it the Bible does leave the option open that it is possible. There is real tension in the scriptures about this question. Now, we come from a tradition, and I am part of that tradition, and this is how I understand the Bible, that it would say, I don't really see how it is possible from the New Testament for someone to have sincere faith in Jesus and then, like, leave it and be gone and be able to separate themselves from God once they've been saved. But 
there is enough in the New Testament to give me pause and have tension with that. And if we're going to trust the Bible over our theological systems, we have to deal with the tension. And that tension is the Bible leaves it as an open possibility. It does. What, what is clear, okay, what is clear, the, the, the question about can someone lose their faith is not clear. What is clear, though, and what Paul is clear about is that all of us, everyone in here, is called to contend, to fight, to struggle for faith in Jesus. Your faith in Jesus and others' faith in Jesus. It's not just about ourselves in this one. There is an individual focus, but there's also a communal focus. And we are to fight and contend and struggle for faith in Jesus, both our own and that of others. So, think back for a second on where we started with, with Rich Strike, okay? Go back to this racehorse and have that kind of image in your head of this horse who's just going after it. And then I want you to think about the Apostle Paul and how he describes his thoughts, his decisions, his actions for the Thessalonians, all right? Even, even what his life must have been like in his own right as he's doing all of this, okay? So think about that. Look at this image. When Paul came to Thessalonica, what did he do? First of all, he came and he preached the gospel to them so that they could have faith in Jesus, even though it cost him. He got beat up in Thessalonica, and he continued to get beat up in other places, but he continued preaching the gospel to people. We looked at in chapter 2 where he said he came and he shared his life with them. He poured out his life for the people in Thessalonica for their growth in faith. After he was gone, what did he do? He constantly thought about them. He was concerned about them. He sent them some of his own resources. He sent them, he gave them his attention. He sent one of his best friends to him. He sent Timothy, who he, Paul really liked having with him, but he sent Timothy to them to encourage them, he says, in their faith. Paul wrote them letters. He mentored them personally. He taught them, and he wanted to teach them more. We see in verse 10 of chapter 3, he says, we wanted to get to you so we could supply what was lacking in your faith. And then he ends with this prayer all the time. He's praying for the church and the Christians in Thessalonica, praying for them and for their faith, as we're going to see in a moment. But this is his life. He's just going and going and going. Do you see that image? He's just getting after it. He's got one thing, their faith. And just because he's an apostle and has a special call from God does not make him unique in this contending and fighting for faith in Jesus. This is a church-wide call. This is the call of Jesus where he says, come and follow me. Continue to follow me. Keep following me. Die to yourself, as we, as we know, and follow me. That's the call. Now, before we close, I, I want you to see how you can hear all this and not panic. Okay? Hey, you can hear all this and not just start wringing your hands and go, I hate this. I don't want to talk about this. Some of you might be like really you know, incur or, you know, excited and be like, yeah, let's go after it. You're like that kind of person. Some of you might be like, I hate this. Why are you saying all of this? Well, let's look at how Paul ends this, okay? Because it would be right for us to panic if all of what we're talking about was left up to us. If all this was left up to you, you would be right to panic. But let's look at how he finishes, okay? Verses 11 through 13. It's a prayer. He's praying for the church through writing. Listen to how he says it. He says, Now may our God and Father himself and the Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. And let me pause. Paul knows that they've remained faithful. right? He, he knows that they've kept the faith. They've kept going. Timothy went and visited the church. Timothy came back to Paul, and he's given them this account. So Paul knows that even though he was worrying for them, they've continued to make it. They still are holding faith. But he still wants to get there to keep encouraging them, to keep supplying more for their faith, to keep helping them, okay? But he's praying now. He says, may, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. And may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Here's what I really want you to hear. And may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Now, I'm going to jump ahead just a bit. I want you to connect this. If you have, an op if you have your, your worship order, you won't see this, but if you have a Bible, you will see this. In verse 5, chapter 23, uh, Paul says the same thing. And listen to how he says it here. He says, may God himself, he's praying again. He's giving an exhortation of prayer. He says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Same thing he just said, 
in chapter 3. Now listen to this. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. He will do it. What is Paul doing as he prays this prayer in writing for the church in Thessalonica? What's he saying to you? What's he saying to the church there? He's asking God to strengthen them so that they would continue to have faith, hold on to Jesus so that when they're found in the presence of God, they would be found in Christ, blameless, as one of his holy ones. In other words, simply that they would keep holding to their faith in Jesus. He's asking God to provide the strength for them to do that. And then in chapter 5, he says, and he will do it. Listen, as you fight for faith in Jesus, you and I, we all need to know that Jesus right now is fighting for you. He's fighting for me. He's fighting for this church. He's contending for us and our faith. He has already fought for you and won when he died for your sin and guilt on the cross. He's already fought and won for you when he conquered your death by rising from the grave. He's already fought and won for you when he crushed the head of Satan under his foot by both his uh, crucifixion and his resurrection. And now he is fighting for you every moment of every day. He is with you, he goes with you, he's for you, and he gives you what you need to persevere and and persist in faith. He will get you through. He is fighting for you. You're not doing this on your own. None of us are. But Jesus is with us, and he will do it. He will do it. So, now what? What do we do as we go home? Here's how I want to leave it today, okay? I want to encourage you, because I think it's important. I want to encourage you to consider, to think about this week, just what it means that your faith in Jesus is the most valuable thing you have. That truly is your most valuable possession. It is through your faith that you have received all that Jesus has accomplished for you. Think about what it means to fight for it, for you and for others. As you think about fighting for faith in Jesus in your family, for your neighbors, for your coworkers, whoever they might be and wherever they might be in their faith. And then think about yourself, how can you do this personally? How do you fight for faith? How do we in this church? Well, we do it by what we're doing right now, through worship, by coming and weekly declaring the excellencies of God, affirming our faith in him, hearing from his word, being nourished through the sacraments week after week, through Bible study, yes, obviously through prayer. If Paul is contending for others through prayer, how can we not contend for others and for ourselves through prayer, through obedience? taking those steps of faith and obedience to him, following him. Maybe something as simple as just getting a cup of coffee with someone in our church body to encourage each other in continuing to walk in faith. How can I pray for you? How can I encourage you? Here's what I need help with. Can you please pray for me? We need each other in this this pursuit of faith. So we need to rely on each other and rest on each other. And always as we go... We rely upon the gospel, the good news that Jesus has conquered. He is in our life through that faith. He is the one who will work in our lives to lead us to the end where we will uh, wind up with him, his faithful ones who are holy and blameless in his sight because of his power and grace in our lives. He is faithful and he will do it. So let us all fight for faith in Jesus, knowing that Jesus is fighting for us. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your promises to us that we cling to week after week, that you are for us, that you are with us, that if, if, if Christ is for us, who could be against us, that nothing can separate us from your love. And yet, Lord, we know that you call us to continue to follow after Jesus, to pursue you, God, with faith, trust, dependence, and obedience, and we ask that you would give us all we need to do that, every moment of this coming week and every moment of our lives going forward. Lord, we want, we want the life that you've come to give us. We trust that you will do what it takes for us to receive that and to enter your glory at the end of all things. We commit this to you now, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we turn now to our time 
of communion as we do every week. And because of the message that you just heard, I want to, have, I want to encourage you to receive communion this morning, to come up this morning as you prepare. I want you to prepare to receive this, this bread and this juice with joy and with celebration. This is a time for you to experience and receive the good news of the gospel right now as you come and receive the meal. Why? Because in the bread and in the wine, what do we see? We see the work of Jesus, the salvation he has accomplished for you and through me. Through his body broken and his blood shed, he has conquered everything that could ever keep us from salvation with him. And, that, and not only that, but every week we're reminded he is with us. He's at work in our lives, and he will see us to the end. We're reminded of this this morning. Through Jesus' death, he has overcome every one of your sins, every one of your failures. He's overcome your death. He's overcome Satan, our greatest enemy. Celebrate in that. Rejoice in that. Believe that this morning. No matter how weak you may feel right now, no matter how scared you might feel, how guilty you might feel, Jesus is stronger than all of that. He's stronger than everything you've faced. He's stronger than everything you've ever done. He's stronger than your emotions in the moment. Trust him this morning and believe that. He wants you to come this morning to him in faith and be strengthened by him by letting him fight for you. And in this meal, we see the greatest way he's done that, by giving his life for you and for me that we can live. He is the risen king. He has won. So this morning, in faith and with joy, celebrate our Savior's victory for us. So if you would stand, please stand. As we come this morning, as we do every week now, I'm going to encourage you to come down the middle to receive the bread and the wine, and then go around the sides back to your uh, seat around the side that makes the easiest path for you. We invite all the adults who have put their faith in Jesus and say, I trust in him, I believe the gospel, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior, come forward this morning and receive uh, communion. With that said, let me read to us the words of institution from 1 Corinthians, what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it saying, this is my body given for you, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup of the new covenant, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So with one voice, as one church, let us proclaim the mystery of our faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, hallelujah. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving, the body and blood of Christ broken and shed for you.
you stand as we close our service in song? Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you have been and faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the your kindness makes us all you shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own you're making me like you you're clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes for you will have your bride free of all her guilt and rid of all her shame by her true name and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips and you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints As you go this week, church, go and may God strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. May he give you courage and joy and peace. And may you hold fast to the one who is holding fast to you. And go knowing that the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen.